All right, hello everybody. This is uh, the Great Johannes podcast number 62, I think. I'm going to talk about this uh, Dugan interview with uh, Tucker Carlson. I cut some clips, just three minutes or so. Uh, let me just go through it briefly and give my comments. Everything started with individualism. So individualism, uh, that uh, was a wrong understanding of the human nature, of the, of the nature of man. You cut all the relations uh, to everything else. And everything started in, in the Anglo-Saxon world with Protestant reform and with nominalism. Before that, nominalist attitude that there are no ideas, only things, only individual things. All right, let's pause here for a moment. What did you just say? He said that um, individualism, which is something I've spoken out against many times before. You can find some of my uh, earlier podcast videos where I talk about uh, Jordan Peterson, who seems to also promote this radical individualism to be a rational, uh, rationally self-interested person. Uh, uh, and I was arguing rather in favor of uh, communities, families, uh, ethno-nationalism, uh, if you want to call it that way. But Dugan here says that, no, it's, um, it started with, uh, with nominalism, which he says the idea that there are, no, there are no ideas, just things, right? So that's the opposite of what is called German idealism. Uh, German idealism means you believe a chair is a chair because you believe a chair is a chair. Uh, you use it as a chair. You can also use a chair as uh, firewood, for example. So what is it? Is a chair firewood or a chair? Depends on how you use it. And so German idealism says how you mentally picture things matters a lot to what the thing is. You can use a knife as a cutting tool. You can also use a knife as a screwdriver. You can probably even use a knife for uh, art, as an art decoration or whatever. So... Uh, yeah, a knife is a knife, but it, you can also use it as a screwdriver. So it is also a screwdriver. So it depends on uh, on your mental picturing and framing of the thing you are using. No, say the nominalists, or rather the materialists, right? The, those are the, the Western materialists, mind you. This comes from the West. Western materialists say, no, 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 no. A chair is just that. It's just an objective chair. And the knife is objectively a knife. There's nothing more to it. There's no ideas or pictures or images or imaginations. Interestingly, the uh, German philosopher Martin Heidegger also railed against this a lot and said, also disagrees with the fact and even goes so far as to conclude in the end, uh, everything is just perception and imagination. We only perceive a chair as a chair because we imagine it as as a chair, and so on and so forth. So Heidegger uh, and myself included go against this materialist nonsense where we say that, oh, there are no ideas. There's just stuff and things. And then Dugan here explains that, and that is where the Protestant Reformation really comes from. Protestant Reformation was, as you'll explain later, uh, an attack against Catholicism, the Roman Catholic Church from the Southern Europe. So it's interesting, of course, to see the dynamics here. Uh, Catholicism that's Southern European and Protestantism came from the north. He says the Anglo-Saxon rule, that's the English and the Danish and, and the Norwegians and perhaps to some extent also the Dutch and so on. That's where this uh, Protestantist reform really came from. Famously, of, of course, uh, Martin Luther, the German Martin Luther, not the black guy. And Martin Luther is interesting because I've read Martin Luther and I've always very much agreed with his beliefs, his way of looking at things. Uh, even though I was uh, baptized Roman Catholic myself. So I'm from the Catholic south of the Netherlands. Uh, and I can totally always understand the Protestant people's need to rail against Catholicism. During the so-called colonial age of Europe, guess who actually went to the USA, to Canada, to South, America, to, uh, South Africa, and to uh, Australia and New Zealand? They were mostly Protestants and some Catholics too, but it was mostly Protestants fleeing Catholic oppression. Uh, at some point, uh, the king of Spain sent 10,000 soldiers, Catholic soldiers, to go to the Netherlands to exterminate the Protestants just as they were fleeing the Netherlands under Peter Stuyvesant to go to New York City or what is now New York City and so on and so forth. So interesting then that the Protestants whom I can very much understand as railing against Catholicism, because Catholicism, I mean, maybe I need to explain this, because why did the Protestants rail against Catholicism? 
Famously, Martin Luther himself once went on a pilgrimage for, from Germany, northern Germany, all the way to Rome. And when he arrived to Rome, what, what did he find there? He felt that the Catholic Church of his day, 16th century Europe, had become like a corporation. In fact, the Catholic Church was the first corporation in Europe, and they were selling indulgences. You know what an indulgence is? An indulgence is uh, basically you've sinned and you're going to go to hell, but I'll sell you an indulgence. <laughs> I'll sell it to you for, I don't know, 10% of your annual wage. You buy one and now you can go to heaven again. So you sin again and you buy another indulgence. And so the business of selling indulgences to faithful people had become so lucrative that Martin Luther complained that Rome was all about wealth. It was about riches. Rome was incredibly rich in those days. They had all the gold and all the silver, right? And the peasants had nothing because they were sinners because they had to buy indulgences and so on and so forth. So the, the Protestants, I think, correctly railed against the Vatican because the Vatican had sim simply become a commercial outfit at, at, at this point. And it made sense, of course, to go against that. And here you see, of course, why perhaps Northern European countries even today are a bit more leftist, whereas Southern European countries are, have always been a little bit more right wing. I don't know, think of uh, Falangian Spain or Franco Spain or whatever, or Mussolini, of course. And then it comes, guess who, uh, Mr. Mustache from Germany. He came from the South, from Bavaria, from Munich, right? So again, Southerners, right? So, so the Catholics, of course, have done their counter-revolution to push back against it and so on and so forth. But let's watch, uh, watch a little more about uh, what Dugan has to say. It is a kind of historical and cultural and political and philosophical process of liberation of individual of any kind of collective identity, collective or uh, the, 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 that transcend, uh, transcends uh, uh, individual. And that started with uh, refuse of Catholic Church as collective identity. Uh, after that, it was a uh, revolt against a national state as collective identity in favor of a purely civil society. After that, uh, that war, there was a big fight of the 20th century between uh, liberalism, communism, and fascism. And liberalism has won once more. Yes. So, and after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was only liberalism. And liberalism, uh, that was uh, liberation of this individual uh, from any kind of collective identity. There were only two. Uh, collective identities to liberate from. Well, I'll pause right here for a moment. So he explains that liberalism is uh, effectively about liber progress what progressive liberalism is about progressively liberating you from everything that makes you, everything that designates you, meaning every group that you're a part of. They see you being part of a family as somehow a uh, oppression that they need to liberate you from. So they want to liberate you from your family. They want to liberate you from your uh, your nation, your national, sorry, your nationality. And of course, since the French Revolution, nationality has changed. The word nation literally used to mean race. And the word race was so narrowly defined that 500 people living on an island off of Denmark were considered a race on their own, right? And people who didn't look like you or weren't from where you're from uh, simply were not even part of your race. So uh, nation and nationalism. Now we say ethno nationalism, which is funny because it used to be just nationalism. Nationalism was always ethno nationalism, right? Until they changed it, until nationalism became a passport. And now someone from Nigeria can move to Scotland and they can say, I'm a real Scottish explorer. No, <laughs> your passport is Scottish. You are a Bantu Nigerian or something else, or a Yoruba Nigerian, or wherever you are, ethnically speaking. And so this detachment from ethnicity and race and biology because that's a group right you're part of a group right family clan tribe all these things were supposed to be deconstructed so that you could become uh, an isolated individual now there's another man named shane simonson from australia southern australia he's starting organic farming but he did an interview with geopolitics and empire recently and explained well do you know why they really wanted to liberate individuals from their families, their clans, their tribes. Because imagine you have the USA and you have all the main industry on the coastal areas, right? Because you have shipping lanes and so on for trade. How do you get individuals from rural Montana or rural Utah 
to leave their families behind and go and work in the factories of LA or, or Miami or New York and Chicago and so on. Well, you got to break down the family because if people stay closely knit together that they don't want to separate, then how can you exploit these individuals? If you need two over here on the East Coast, you need two, two brothers on the West Coast and a sister in, in Chicago, that doesn't work. People, if, you, if people refuse to let go of their families, then you cannot pull them apart and send them around the nation towards all these factories, which is exactly what the American capitalist system needed to do. And this process has continued to this day, even in the form of migration, because reminder, uh, migra migrants coming from Mexico to the, to the U.S. and so on, they're also spread around the nation. They also have to leave their families, their nation. And so globalism is all about atomizing human beings into basically people living in a shipping container. You may have heard the, the meme of Klaus Schwab and saying that uh, uh, eat bugs and live in a pod. Except what you didn't know is that pod is going to be a shipping container. Your house will be a shipping container and they can ship you and your stuff, your private belongings around the globe to wherever work is needed. So one, one day you'll wake up in Shanghai and three months later you'll wake up in LA and three months later you'll wake up <coughs> in the Kapstadt in South Africa. They'll just ship you around to wherever labor is needed. That is, of course, the, the wet dream of the capitalist internationalists, right? Uh, let's go on with, uh, with Dugan over here. To liberate from uh, gender identity, because it, it is collective identity. You are man or woman collectively, so you could yes. be alone. Uh, so uh, a liberation from gender, and that uh, has uh, led to transgenders, uh, to LGBT, and new form of sexual individualism. And the last step that is not yet to totally, totally made is liberation from human identity, humanity optional. And when now we are choosing, or you in the West, you are, uh, you are choosing uh, the sex you want, as you want. And uh, the last uh, step in this process of uh, liberalism, implementation of liberalism, will mean precisely the hu human optional. So you can choose your individual identity to be human, not to be human, and that has a name: transhumanism, posthumanism, um, singularity, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, Klaus Schwab, uh, Kurzweil, or Harari. Exactly. I'll pause here because uh, although, as I just explained. The Protestants railing against Catholicism in a time when the Catholic Church had become the first Europe's first corporation, basically, before the West India Company or the East India Company even. So, uh, and they were exploiting people, selling them indulgences, basically ripping people left and right to enrich the clergy in Rome so that they could live in wealth and luxury. Uh, and <clears throat> so it starts out as a good thing and it completely devolves because as they first try to get people away from the Catholic Church, that's the first thing, right? And then from their nations, and then from their tribes, and then from their families, and then from their sex, their gender, basically, and then from their uh, 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 from their uh, individuality itself, from their humanity itself. You see that this process that started out as something that I would agree to has devolved in something absolutely anti-human and catastrophically evil. And at the same time, that the benefactors of this process are the new big corporations of the material globalist world. So it starts with an attack on the Vatican for being a corporation, and it ends with thousands of corporations benefiting from a process that has gone too far. We have over-individualized, hyper-individualized. Uh, this is why I don't like Jordan Peterson. He has said, you can watch the video somewhere where he literally says, human beings, uh, a man should be a radical individual pursuing his rational self-interest, which is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. No, I believe that human beings should live as families, clans, tribes, not just the Muslims who live in London or the Pakistanis who live in Bradford, but also us, our own people living in Europe have the right to have some tribal connection so that we don't stand alone. Because as an individual, you will never be powerful enough to overthrow the state. Because, mind you, the state people, they're not elected. <laughs> 
It may sound like they're elected because you think it's a democracy, but they're not elected. The actual people in charge of the states of the West, of the Western globalist system, they are a closely knit tribe of people right, uh, who promote their own family and friends. That's called nepotism, family and friends only. right? So you promote your cousin to this job or you promote your son to that job. Uh, the son of Franz Timmermans, a Dutch dictator, uh, now works for the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Hmm. That's nepotism. Uh, the class of people who rule over us are a minority of people who are themselves ethno-nationalist, far-right, conservative, right? Uh, and if you call them out, they will call you anti-Semitic. So think about that for a moment. So let's go back to Dugan. They openly declare that is inevitable future of humanity. So you are no more Protestant. You are secular, atheist, materialist. You are no more national state that served to liberal to liberate from empire. And now a uh, national state becomes um, at its turn obstacle. You are liberating from national state. Uh, finally, family uh, is destroyed in favor of this individualism. And the last things, the sex that is already almost overcome, uh, sex optional and uh, in gender politics, there is only one step to, to arrive to, uh, to the end of this process of liberation, of liberalism. That is the abandoned human identity as something prescribed. And now we are not about uh, defense of the individual freedom, but about prescription to be woke, to be uh, to be modern, to be progressive. You, it is not uh, your uh, it is not your right to be or not to be progressive. It is your duty to be progressive, to follow this agenda. Exactly. The conclusion, however, is something that Dugan fails to mention here, is that once you have atomized all human beings into these rational self-interested individual uh, units that you can ship around in shipping containers, your pod. Uh, it won't stay that way. Once you have made all people individuals, remove them from their religion, from their nation, from their sex, from their everything. Now they become a canvas for others to impose new group ideals. So they try the universal humanity thing the one world religion, the one one human race, one language, we're all going to speak Esperanto or some, some, nonsensical, some nonsense like that. What I think is going to happen is very different. They will not be able to do this. The globalists may say all these things, but the thing is, people have only been atomized in public. In private, people have not changed that much much privately people do still feel very much connected to say their group of friends uh, or their colleagues if you have to uh, they do have this strong sense of family and they do crave and want these things still because people were never blank slates that could simply be programmed with culture at all the cultural imagine theory of gramsci is actually just nonsense because it's not how it works there is uh an attempt to impose cultural hegemony onto a people. And then there's the people who themselves, who from themselves within themselves have a different experience that is countering the cultural hegemony. So corporations can only go so far in brainwashing average ordinary human beings. The average ordinary human beings are still biological beings, mammals, and mammals have desires for things like family and belonging and belief, shared belief systems, you want to live with your equals and so on and so forth, right? And so it doesn't work. The hyper-individualism that is promoted by the transhumanists doesn't really work because there is inside everybody's heart, mind, and soul another force at work that counters the nonsense from the outside world. What will happen, however, is when the outside world becomes too oppressive, People are either just going to pretend to be going along or ultimately, which is what I, th what I think is going to happen, <laughs> dismiss it. People are going to wake up from this bad dream and realize we don't have to go along with this anymore. And at that point, the new spiritual revivalist movement, of which I hope to be a part, will simply clarify people that they are allowed to have all the things that they naturally feel they want. Family, friends, uh, belonging, spiritual and religious consensuses, right? So that what we can do is we can take these 
apparently atomize individuals and give them back their race, give them back their gender, their sex, right, their family, and reorient people toward completely different goals. And I think it will be even very easy to do so, and it can be done very quickly. It may be done in a decade or less, where people will all of a sudden wake up from the bad dream that was individualist, capitalist, materialist nonsense, and they go back to the life of the spiritual uh, family-oriented future. And that will have implications for the social order. Since the present social order was built on top of this capitalist disintegration of human beings to maximize everybody's profit, we are going to become less profitable people. And as a result, the economies that have made us slaves will have to collapse, which is a good thing. So we can burn the factories, we can burn the assembly lines. People simply won't have Teslas in the future. There won't be flying cars either, and no drones, and perhaps even no more cell phones. Even this equipment here will just uh, be obsolete and will no longer be used in the future, because in the future, we're going to have big families again.